Hello everybody, with over 100,000 followers, this digital artist is admired around the world. He's revolutionizing the world of computation designs and has joined us today to discuss artificial intelligence and architecture, mid-journey AI, a digital image generator, and his personal touch of integrating creativity and technology. Join us today for this exciting episode with digital artist Hassan Ragab to discuss artificial intelligence, technology, and art. Hi Hassan, hi Ria, thanks for coming. Uh, welcome to Data Basic, uh, the World Data Science Podcast. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today, Hassan, and uh, this is going to be our episode using Mid Journey AI and Data Science in Architecture. Uh, Ria and I will be hosting you for the, uh, for the episode today, so uh, yeah, I uh, hope you will enjoy it and have a nice conversation with you. Thank you guys, uh, ha- thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm looking forward for the conversation. Cool. Um, I'll start by asking you uh, if you could please give us background about yourself and uh, what and where did you study and uh, what is your current role right now? Yeah, so yeah, I, I'm i Egyptian. Uh, I was born and raised in Alexandria and I went to school, like the architecture school in Alexandria. I was graduated back in 2010. And since then, I had like various topics. I've been jumping around from like one area of design and architecture to another. So I I worked in exhibition design and museography for a while. Uh, I always had interest in computational design since I was in college. Um, I also did furniture design for a while. Uh, bef- and then I moved to the United States here in 2018. And I started taking a computational designer job uh, in architecture and construction. And that's kind of my current role right now. And so is that company. I've been doing that for the past almost four years. And um, yeah, like that's my day life and my night life is like I'm doing digital art and exploring architecture uh, conceptualization using uh, artificial intelligence, like tools like Bidjourney or DALI2 or Stable Diffusion, stuff like that. Yeah, maybe before going to the AI and the interesting bit for our audience, could you please explain us what uh, computational design is for the people that are not aware of the subject? So computational design uh, in a nutshell is the discipline in architecture and design, which is mainly concerned about producing designs using computational methods or computational tools in means of it, instead of just using the uh, computer software as means of like visual modeling, you also use it as a way to control your model data. So one very simple uh, example of that is like the usage of like BIM, which is like building information modeling, which is mainly based on parametric modeling, which is like the essential um, uh the essential topic or the essential use of computational design where you make meaningful relationships with your between your components so whenever for example like you can create a parameter that can control the height of the building and the width of the building on the same time like setting like a proportion for example um but like the true meaning of computational design goes beyond that where you actually n- using the data to form your model. You don't just model that visually, but no, you actually use data. Uh, These data could be anything, could be uh, information about the climate in the area of the building. It could be material efficiency. It could be structure. Uh, It could also be uh, like mathematical factors like to build your model with. So it's like a a more in-depth way for, for us like architects and designers to have more control over uh, our models. And that results in not only creating very uh, complex or very, very complex or very out of our imagination uh, designs uh, that we couldn't have modeled otherwise, because again, computer can make a lot uh, of complex calculation that we just can't, or it will take us a long time to do. So we, we, we ended up like having uh, over the past two decades, I think, like these, um, what you call it, like unimaginable structures uh, that has emerged in our cities. And uh, not only 
computational design allows it allows us to uh, visualize them, but it actually allows us to build them. We couldn't have built these tools without like computational tools because we like the uh, the computer is just the uh, the building that we're building using these tools is just very complex to be achieved otherwise. Um, so that's like the big umbrella of the computational design. There, there can come a lot of topics under like the meaning of computation, but I think that's kind of the general idea of uh, computational design. Uh, that's quite interesting considering like because uh, you, you wouldn't think that in architecture data is actually used, but luckily for us, uh, the data scientists, data is present everywhere nowadays and uh, hmm? it's, it's made great use. Again, like like you said, it like data is kind of controlling our life, and uh, uh, like it's not any different in design and architecture because like you can use these data like from the start of building your model. Again, even after building your model, I mean, this data lives with the building. So, like for example, for like maintenance reasons, or if you want like to change any like. Um, if you want to add like an extension to your building, for example, like this data will be very useful instead of like going back to the field and just like making sure where was what. So again, that's like the what I'm what I'm talking about right now is like the uh, the construction side of the computational design, uh, which I don't think a lot of students, a lot of people are kind of talking about and or how important is computational design for construction. Everybody's really interested in making like very unique forms or like you know like uh, like crazy shapes but uh, yeah that i mean that's like again yeah that's very nice but like i think the true power of uh, computational design is like acquiring the data for your model to not only to visualize it but also to build it and also to control the building uh, after the construction phase i think we can uh, make a like, comparison because in data science it's it's a fancy word and it's uh, like a buzzword nowadays but the real meaning besides all the AI and all the data visualization that can, can come out of it is the real uh, real value that uh, it's added uh, when you actually take the data and look beyond it, look for insights, look for ways to improve your model, in your case, uh, buildings and uh, other, other important things in, in different topics. I had a question for you. Your art is loved. Your designs are loved across the world. What serves as an inspiration to you? How do you come up with, uh, you know, ideas? And if you could walk us through your process with maybe an example from ideation to the final product, what does that process look like? Mm -hmm. OK, uh, so yeah, so my artwork is mainly uh, using like artificial intelligence tool, which is like uh, uh, it's AI text to image generators. So the way that you use these tools is that you put a textual description to the tool itself, and then you get like variation of the images, and then you uh, start to either like upscale one of them or like choose a, a variation, and that you like you make a variation of a certain uh, variation, if I have to say. And uh, I was I'm mainly concerned with making connections between architecture and visual arts. Um, these tools are purely artistic, so they are not like uh, architectural or design ready yet. You can't really make any um, design with it. Uh, so I'm like my main, my main concern since I started using these tools is to try to make the best out of them through trying to um, explore them to create new visual um, data set or visual library that to use for architecture. So I. Like my inspiration, I guess it's like everything. Probably it's architecture. Sometimes it comes from like my home, my my home country, like Egypt, uh, because it has such a rich uh, architectural history, uh, which which is great. Which is like it's really nice to explore. And um, basically, like anything else, I guess. And I guess like everybody kind of is kind of picking up on that. There are many architects and designers are trying to um make connections between architecture and things that's irrelevant or like didn't make any connection before um so yeah it's kind of like i'm always trying to explore more how we can change the architectural vocabulary vocabulary uh, in such a conceptual sense um so yeah like and when i like usually when i start um 
my process, I just start with like a simple uh, prompt or like a simple tool for like simple, sorry, simple text. Um, for example, like I'll say like a building uh, and then I'll just like see the variation, like how a building looks like. And then I can start adding a style to the building, like an Art Nouveau building, for example, or like Art Deco building. And uh, after that, I'll start adding like an Art Nouveau building that's made of feathers. So now I can see uh, how the feathers are like connected with this style. And then maybe I'll go back and change that style. For example, like maybe if Art Nouveau didn't work, I'll try like different style um, just to see like if my components kind of will integrate together nicely. And once I settle on like um, a good um, a good thing or like when I have a good vibe like that's yeah, this probably will look somewhere because again, this is really hard to kind of make like the initial layers of your artwork using um, tools like Midjourney because again, it's really complex. It's so unpredictable, so at, out of control. So uh, I, I always like to be so, sometimes I'll always like to be very careful while adding layers to it. But yeah, once I have like a good, uh, once I feel like there's a good thing that will be coming out of this, I'll start to adding more like uh, what they call like a styling prompts, which is like now I can try to add like cameras or like like a view that I want to see, maybe add colors, add a level of realism or something. And after that, it will probably take me about like a uh, few thousands <laughs> iterations. Oh, just wow. try to get that. Yeah. Uh, well, sometimes there are hundreds, but like, <laughs> yeah, and if I want to get something that's really good, I have to do a lot of variations. Uh, so I, I, usually, I usually do a lot of images to achieve. Um, I, but again, I think I'm doing so because I'm really interested um, not in what I can achieve, but actually what the tool can generate. Because I think that's kind of the true power of the AI. It will generate something that I haven't really thought of. Because again, if I if I can think of th something and I want to create it, I'll just go and model it. That's like mm -hmm. that's kind of my job. That's something that anybody can do. I have like the, the skill set to make me able to model what I can think of. Uh, but uh, like the true power of the AI is to try to uh, get something that you really haven't thought of, like to push your imagination in ways. Um, so yeah, I'm always kind of in that process of like exploration. So that that that's kind of some of my my process in a way. I and um, I just deviating a bit. Um, I was uh, watching this documentary on Go. Um, so um, the Google's AI team. Um, um, oh, is it oh, Open AI? No, it's not Open AI. It's the other one. Um, uh, imagine the Google is developing Imagine. Imagine that's for generative, but they like they have a deep mind. So the deep mind company, oh, because it's a, okay, yeah, it's okay. a subsidiary yeah. of uh, oh, Google. Okay. Um, they they what they do is they take uh, games and they try to make a really general AI to solve yeah. different games to to become the best player out of uh, out of that game. So when it, they did it with Go, which is way more complex than oh, chess. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. When it played the the best player, uh, the watchers and the people that were uh, commenting it on it, they just they were surprised by one of the one of yeah. the ways uh, the AI was. Uh, yeah, they thought like it's an, an amateur move, and they would lose. But eventually, like yeah, yeah, it turned out yeah. to be the best strategy. It's like it came up with its own strategy that we could have never come up with. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then they don't know if if they can call it as uh, like they can call it uh, an imagine, imaginative to, uh, move or a creative one. Like, because when we talk about these things, they are human things. So we're not sure yet if we can uh, label uh, AI with, with these words, but that was like surprising anyway. Yeah, I think, so yeah, I think like what we call, again, I think the problem is what we actually call creativity. I mean, creativity yeah. is such a deceiving world, a deceiving word. In the sense of like it's uh, it gives the sense of like creating something out of nothing, which is actually not true. That's something that's that that's like a god mind or a god idea to create something out of nothing. But us human or even nature, uh, it's we're just not able to do that. Or like nature is not able to create something out of nothing. Or at least that's like uh, our understanding of it. 
and so is like the creative field. So the way I like to think about it, or like for that example, for like the Go example, the Go game example that you're saying, the way I think about it is that all the moves are there in a way, and they are limited by the game itself. Mm -hmm. But it's about how much power, how much brain power, how much computation power do you have to actually find out all the games and find out all the scenarios. Which is kind of, which again, this is not like creating something out of nothing. It's it's already there, and the way that I like to think of, and I think it's the same uh, with like ideas in the creative fields, like arts and architecture and design. Um, everything is there, you know. There's a lot of things uh, that's there in the world, and we're just like trying to explore it. The thing about like using these tools, it's that it allows us to explore it more because it makes a lot of connections between so many irrelevant ideas or fields just in, in in such a fast way, which is incredible. I think some people kind of make uh, the analogy of um, now being a user or being a designer or whatever you are, who is using these AI tools, you're actually more like an archeologist who is digging the space, what you call, why do you call it the latent space? to get these new forms that are, that are already existing. Um, so I think, yeah, it, it just like it all comes down to our own understanding as human beings of what is creativity and what's novel. And uh, uh, these tools, they are basically doing the same thing that we're doing, but just much faster, you know, just like cars or just like phones or like the laptop or like the calculators or the Excel. It's <laughs> it's just a, so yeah, it's it, it's not smart or it's it's as smart as we allow to be at that point at least. Uh, until we hit the point of singularity, which again, I don't know, even if we hit that again, it's it I think it will be limited by its knowledge. It has to find a way to bypass the knowledge in ways that we couldn't. But since we created it, I don't know how it will come that that will be like the true leap not to become a sentient being, but actually to bypass the uh, the word creativity or like the word of like uh, uh, escaping creativity from like making connections between existing things and like for it, it is to come up with like it's new thing. So I don't think like we should be surprised by anything that AI is doing because we probably can't, could have done that, but it just would have taken as much time. We we already did that because we built that. We we built it. Like when you travel to another city, you don't say my car did it. No, I, I did it. I used the car. We built a car and we did it. So uh, I I I think yeah, it's uh, it's all about our understanding of what it means to be creative or our understanding of like the technology that we need. Yeah, that's right, because uh, in the end, uh, I think the car analogy is good because uh, there are tools and we create tools as, and uh, uh, as uh, as until now, I think human is, uh, human nature is quite good at creating these tools to make our lives easier or to make yeah, things. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm not <laughs> sure it's easy. I mean, yeah, I don't think like human beings are right. I mean, we're exploring. I feel like we're just like but the humanity are just like a bunch of children who are like trying to explore what's going on in the world or trying to take control over our world and like, you know, trying to be supreme in a way. And uh, in the process, we make like these very interesting tools. But again, these tools are kind of limited by our limitations. I mean, we didn't make something that kind of bypasses the speed of light. I mean, we have the theories, but we can do it. Maybe we can do it in the future if we have better understanding. But again, it's so we will only make these tools once we, our humans, have a better understanding of our surroundings. So, the to I think the, the tools are just as good as we are at that point. <laughs> yeah, and as or as bad as we are. So, yeah. um, I know you you said that uh, in at the moment you are using uh, Midjourney just as a creative means and to uh, make visuals out of it. But do you see data science and AI? leverage in architecture or in construction in any way at the moment or uh, do you see a future for it? Yeah, definitely. Actually, there's a lot. I think like in the, there's a lot of research that's going on. I, I'm not part of it. I mean, I'm not a researcher, but there's a lot of research that's going 
into using AI in architecture and they are reaching like good results with it um, in so many ways. But like, I don't think AI right now is kind of used on a global level or like on at least not on the popular market of architecture. So I don't think you will go and find a building right now, maybe, but it will be very hard to see that. I don't think you will find it, go and find a building right now that works with like AI in the sense of like the AI created that in, in some sense. But of course, there's a lot of like, um, there's a lot of smaller topics in architecture which you can employ AI in these uh, manners uh, or like in these topics. Like you, you can employ AI to uh, help you um, configure uh, a, a more sustainable structure, like to to connect data from the field, like in such an easy way. Um, um, yeah, so I think the future will come with like, now that like you have like these tools like Midjourney or like like these diffusion models, the AI text to image, now that they are popular to the masses or like they are accessible to the masses, everybody can use that. I think now every what everybody's trying to do is to try to uh, integrate that in the architectural practice one day on a, like in one way or another. And that's outside of the academia actually. Now it's like, you know, instead of like having like a few thousand researchers that are just like working on their labs on a certain product. Now you have like few millions, a uh, few million users who are actually like trying really, really hard and they're collaborating in such ways uh, to to make like that leap uh, from using these tools as computational tools to uh, try to create something physical with it, like something in the real world. Um, and I think uh, one one thing that's being approached like to the masses is now uh, creating AI um, text to 3D. That's something oh, that wow. we don't have right now. Mm -hmm. I, I saw a few papers, like a few research papers that's talking about that and how it's achievable. And a lot of people are trying to uh, go into that. <coughs> uh, I don't know if you guys also saw uh, like the teasers for uh, Meta and Google for their generators, like the AI text to video. Uh, so now, like, I think this will be released very soon where you mm -hmm. just put the text and then you will have like uh, a mm -hmm. video and that's I think. So, yeah, that's something that's going to come very soon after that. I think there will be the problem like the uh, the AI uh, text to models that will come once that uh, is in play and accessible to the masses. Now more architects will use that in, in a more meaningful way. Um, I don't think in the beginning of having like uh, AI generating models, I don't think it will be sufficient to build architecture or designs yet, but it will act, but there will be hacks or ways to kind of make that work until uh, probably like after that, like in the near future, more integrated platforms will have more AI tools that kind of integrate the visual aspect and like the building or like the 3D modeling aspect uh, to the uh, to the process and the users will be able to access that. After that, you will have more AI, small AI models like uh, imagine like having a one model that's responsible for structure, uh, one model that is responsible for sustainability, one model for like visual visualization, one model for like building. And again, and after that, I think like the future will be um, maybe I don't know how many years from now, but so like uh, there won't be architects anymore and you will just like as a user, you'll just log in on whatever device that you'll be using at that point. Uh, it will be just like Amazon. You will just go on the website, uh, tell it yourself. I want a building. The building is a home and it has like four bedrooms, like two bathrooms and whatever. And then it will generate something for you in real life that you can see. And uh, uh, you can actually, yeah, it's it's not only it's it's just beyond the function to also be on the shape. Like for example, like I want a building by Anthony Gaudi, for example, and uh, it had like few rooms, and I wanted, I wanted to see. So you just give it the location, and give it the and give it like uh, you know your uh, specifics. It will create some variations for you. You just start picking them up, uh, just like customizing your own um, phone case, for example. It will be the same thing, and you just hit purchase, like or like you know you you purchase the building, and then some drones will come pick up the building materials and they will go and assemble the building for you. Um, maybe in the matter of a few hours or days and you will be having your building. And I, yeah, I, I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, that's like the utopian 
uh, uh, scenario, like if everything just like went well and fine. Uh, but I don't, I don't see why we're not heading there because again, everything that I've mentioned in that process, it's kind of actually existing, but kind of by itself in mm -hmm. a way. So like we can program drones to kind of build something in some kind of an order. We have the basic knowledge of that. Um, we know how to train AI models, generate um, uh, images. We know how, how to, to make, to generate models. But again, the problem is we don't have enough data. My cousin uh, um, studied architecture as well. So uh, when I was young, I was visiting him uh, at the university and I saw the whole process and what he was struggling with. And then I followed his uh, path into, into when he was uh, doing actual some freelance job. And I, I saw that uh, a lot of times um, the most painful thing to do was to talk with the customer, with the, with the client, like with the, with the person that is uh, needing the uh, piece of furniture or the piece of uh, ha or the house or, or whatever the need was. Uh, what do you think uh, about right now, somebody trying to use this to come up with quick renderings? Because uh, as I was reading, they can, they, they have the power to generate images really fast. And as you're saying, you can uh, spend a couple of hundreds or thousands of iterations to make something really beautiful. But what about something rough uh, to just uh, show the uh, show it to your client and move on from that? Uh, do you think uh, you might explore using it for, for this purpose? Do you think you can? Uh, is there anybody out there leveraging this power? Yeah, definitely. So I think that's actually how most designers and architects are using these tools right now. They're using it as a rough sketching tools or like very quick sketching tools. So yeah, when I was talking about that, I spent a lot of variation, like a lot of hours of like trying to figure out like the right variation. That's kind of like because me trying to be artistic in a way or just like that's like pure exploration. But yeah, I think there's uh, how this these tools are right now helping architects and designers it's just like how you said it it's like it's the quickest sketching tool uh, ever created like uh, just like it's it's faster than anything we usually spend a lot of hours trying to model or street render like you know ideas for the clients and um, yeah i mean like right now i'm kind of working in a on a project it's actually a movie and actually, I'm a conceptual artist for uh, for that movie. So I'm not building the 3D model because they actually want to see the idea. If I was build, I mean, I am building 3D model. But again, how I started is it was just by like creating like um, ideas. Like they they wanted to see a lot of ideas and like in such a short time. And I could ha couldn't have modeled that or create that in such a way. So I had to like use the tool in the way that you said it to try to come up with a lot of variations like in a, in a very fast manner. So it's uh, it's how we're using it right now as designers. Just saying congrats on the movie. Maybe yeah. uh, is it going to be a launch? Like uh, how the project is going on? Uh, OK, um, <laughs> it's going. I don't know. I, I mean, I can't really talk about it. It's not a big movie. It's not a Hollywood movie, so it's. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, Christopher Nolan just didn't like, you know, ha he doesn't have my number yet. So yeah, I'm not at that <laughs> point. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I mean, I think, yeah, it, it's it's really interesting to see. Uh, it's again, yeah, this is kind of my very first project to you to be entirely using AI uh, into the process. Uh, it's actually, I mean, I've been in the conceptual part of like uh, the design for like a a very long period of my life, but right now I'm in the I'm in construction, so it's like the ex, the the exact opposite of what I used to do, or actually what I'm doing in the movie right now. So it was really interesting to see um, what ideas I can come come up with and how these ideas kind of can can challenge uh, the um, the client, uh, you know, like uh, visual like visuals or like the client ideas of how the project. Uh, how they thought thought the project would want to be. I think they approached. I mean, I think the clients approached me because again, because I'm using the journey because what I'm creating They They approached me after like I, I started to have some like public presence uh, on social media. Uh, but but again, it's still interesting uh, to see how it's it going. How's it going? But 
again, I think at one point of the project, I hit the limitation uh, of how much I can control the tool. And uh, I started like, for example, now we wanted to talk about like a certain scale for the project. And now I tried like my best to do that with my journey and it just wasn't possible. I actually, I actually went crazy. I, I didn't only use like one generator. I used like Midjourney, Dali2, and Simple Diffusion, and they're all like I used them all in parallel. Like I kept like uh, creating images with Midjourney and then adjust them in Dali2, and then adjust them in Simple Diffusion, and then go back. It's just like it's like exploring my own way. It's, it's just I just like didn't know what to do. It was crazy. Uh, but then eventually I had a point where I said like okay no now like because I know what I really wanted to do. I really need to do that the old fashioned way, which is like um, 3D modeling. So it, it's really, it's really interesting. I have to say, I mean, I'm, I'm still kind of formulating my ideas about it. Um, but yeah, it's, I think it's really interesting. Yes, cool. That's amazing, Hassan. And uh, so another question for you is for a student who's wanting to explore this space of computational designs and 3D modeling, or maybe the different approaches in AI and architecture, what would be your advice to them or what would be your suggested approach for these students who want to explore this space? So I think like exploring the space is very uh, easy and very affordable, especially for students. So I think a lot of. Um, I think students or at least when I was a student, I had more uh, creative freedom than the one I had uh, when I worked in the practical field, right? Um, unless you own your own business, you are not really, or unless you're like very, I don't know, very, very lucky, very talented. There's something like to be like a creative person in that, in, in this market, in this world, it's kind of really challenging. It's not only enough to be uh, creative or smart uh, to employ your own ideas. I think it's really challenging. Um, this kind of allows a lot of people to do so, and it's especially is better for students because again, students are still living in their like you know in their imaginative world. They don't, they haven't really um, interacted with like the uh, the reality of architecture or or construction, which which is kind of which most of the times I have to say it's really frustrating. Uh, and in all honesty, no matter how no matter how you you hear architects and designers speak about it, uh, you only hear like the stores, right? You only hear like Zaha Hadid or Norman Foster. You only hear like this, like only call a hundred people like talking about it. But beyond those hundred people, there are millions of students or like sorry of like young designers or young architects who are um, who hit a lot of hurdles in the market. Um, and like it's it, no, not a lot of people kind of talk about talk about it, or even if they talk about it, uh, their voices doesn't get very loud. You know, nobody kind of hears them really well. Like their their voices are not resonating um, around the world to kind of make sense of that. But now, like using these tools, there's a good way to represent that in a visual way. Like you know, like become to. I mean, for me, it's a way to become a rebel over. Um, over what we have in our world, you know, over like the materiality, over like, uh, you know, like globalization or capitalism or like, you know, whatever. Like, I, I just don't care. I, I don't care about like building boxes or building something that's kind of sustainable, although maybe it's a good thing to have something that's kind of on a budget or sustainable or like structurally wise or inspired by nature. All these things are like really good and important, but there's a lot of things that's kind of beyond that. Um, I think the market drove uh the creative fields to kind of forget how artistic things could be or like how beautiful things could be in a way and uh using our artistic mediums like these tools like it, it's a good reminder for us to remember it's a good reminder for us to um to remember how architecture is also a visual language it's not only you know, building it's not only money, it's not only uh, structure efficiency, but it also there is like more to it. There's like the human aspect of it. It's not like, you know, it, I feel like because we use computational design so much that we architect, we actually have turned as machines in a way like we are building without really thinking um, what we're doing. And 
I think also like the tools kind of really uh, again, like we're as good as the tools that we're making. So um, like the tools kind of put us in such a mindset to build something in such ways. So if you're using computational design, uh, all your products will look exactly like the same in a way. Like you will always have like this like fractal structures or like nature inspired techniques or like super uh, optimized um, structure systems, for example. Uh, or if you're working like in the uh, at a certain like practice, uh, for example, uh, like if you're working at a certain practice and this practice kind of only building residential houses, you will find yourselves all what you what you're thinking about is like you're building like huge building blocks and you are really trying to make your best to optimize the spaces so you can have the maximum uh, number of units in the building to maximize the profit, for example. Um, this tool now that we're using, it's actually changing our mindset to become more artistic in the sense of architecture um, and how to be like crazy about it. And that's, I think that's where students come, like the student roles comes really important because they actually spend, uh, they spend most of their li architectural life in a way to come up with like these crazy new ideas. And it's great to see how these tools are now being visualized and employed because otherwise it would have been very hard for students to come up with like 50 ideas in like a matter of like two or three months. They would all, they, really, they would usually spend a semester or like a term just doing like one project or one building and this will be a crazy building. Um, so yeah, I mean the students just like need to just like go, go on and just like try to explore the tools. Uh, if they have computational design knowledge, that will be very helpful and it will be helpful for their future, but it's not necessary. So I think I, I over I over answered your question. I'm sorry about that, but it's just. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, it's totally fine. It's totally fine. I think uh, actually because um, these tools are, are coming from the AI side and data science, we might try to play with them to uh, make some some posts for our social media as well. Like uh, when we are doing uh, different events or different uh, 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 things like the podcast, maybe we can try and generate something with them. And yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, you can just go on. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's a crazy. It's a very fun tool. So it's not only it's not like three D modeling. Um, it's it's open access. You don't need to uh, have a lot of experience to play around with it. You can come from any field, not like creative. Of course, if you if you have like experience in like the creative fields, like you know uh, art or architecture, you, you could have, you could do like a little bit better. But again, it doesn't require any kind of experience to just go and play with these. So yeah, just like, try to go make some posters. You'll have you'll have you'll have a class. You'll be addicted. I think it's. It's really cool. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> well, it, because... yeah, I mean, if you're if you're a visual person, if you're like yeah. into like you know arts and like you know creating stuff, but you didn't have the time to either create or if or you, if you don't have the skill, um, this is like the tool for you. So, so now you're making me afraid of it, but I'll definitely try it. Yeah, you, you should be a little bit. Yeah, it's it. I it got me addicted, so <laughs> you should be you should be worried a little bit. Um, but maybe coming back to li the limitations that you, you've been discussing and um, something that uh, it comes out a lot when we are talking about AI in general and uh, data is how biased it can be and how uh, we should try to avoid our own, to put our own biases in, into the models. Uh, yeah. Is it the same uh, with Midjourney and the other tools that you're using? Have you seen such, a, such an example uh, in them and uh, maybe how would you, from your artistic perspective, how you do, how would you go and uh, remove these biases? So yeah, um, so yeah, I, I mean like these tools are created by humans and uh, we put our understandings and our ideas and our biases in that case uh, into these tools. Um, so one bias that I've found uh, in the past using like uh, tools like Midjourney or DALI 2 is that they are they tend to use uh, or like they tend to have in their data set much more information about um, excuse me about Western architecture and styles and they lack the data of like non-Western uh, styles. I call them unpopular styles like you know like not a lot of people are using these kind of styles uh, in their in their prompts and uh, this kind of affecting um 
affecting how I use it or like affecting how many users are are using it in a way. So like, for example, for me at the beginning, it was really much easier for me to uh, create uh, buildings that are kind of have like this Western style uh, or like, for example, like, you know, Zaha Hadid, uh, she's like the famous architect, she has buildings all around the world. Uh, all the architects or like designers, especially young designers, they worship her. They want to do her work. And um, so, and like, because she built, she has built a lot of projects around the world and she has her own unique style or the company has its own unique style. So there's a lot of images in the data set. So it's very much, it's really much easier to create, um, generate images that are based on Zaha's work. So you will see a lot of people like doing this, like fluid forms, these wide fluid forms and these shapes and the, because the, uh, because the, there's a lot of these images in the data set of the models and a lot of people are using it like in their prompts. Uh, the AI tool uh, could handle these in such a wonderful way. Like it creates like beautiful details out of like these kind of prompts, which is like basically Zaha or like fluid forms. On the other hand, if you go back, if you go to like try to deal with like heritage buildings, like for example, uh, temples in the uh, in Egypt or like, you know, Islamic geometry uh, from like from Egypt or like the uh, the Persian geometry uh, from Iran, for example, it, because there, there's, there wasn't, there isn't enough images in the data set and there are not a, peop, a lot of people are using it. The images are always, um, you know, sketchy. The details are not refined. And uh, actually like it was, it's really hard to actually, I was really surprised by uh, to try to uh, search for a certain temple like in Egypt, not a certain temple, but like I tried a few temples uh, of like a pharaonic temples in ancient Egypt and uh, I was mm -hmm. really surprised that I like the the uh, that the mid journey didn't actually recognize it. You know how oh, wow. how like I from like how come you didn't you didn't know El Karn like this like one of the like the the most famous buildings around the world. It just doesn't make sense. It only knows the pyramids, but it doesn't know anything else. And it was kind of I was kind of really surprised by that. But then I think there's a lot of limitations. That's kind of um, I, I mean, it's 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 how they use their their data sets, right? I think the developers are using certain data sets and just the, like the, these data data sets, it just didn't include this kind of material, didn't include these kind of buildings or like kind of styles. And uh, that's kind of bias, but uh, I think the developers right now are like overcoming that. For example, like in the past week, uh, Mid Journey have released a new version and uh, this new version of their models, like it's called V4, um, it has newer data set and it had much better training. So one, once it was released, I tried to go and try like few uh, buildings from like Egypt and actually the results was, were kind of better. It actually started oh. to recognize some like some certain heritage sites, which is which was really interesting for me. Yet again, the details are not fine, like not like, you know, the data set like in Zahadi images or or whatever. Mm -hmm. So. And uh, I used to think about that, like in the past couple of months, I was I was writing a lot of articles about it and I was trying to speak very loudly about it, about how this kind of endangers um, uh, some, the exit, like the, um, the resemblance of our, of the human heritage in the virtual world mm -hmm. in the future. Because like, if you don't have enough information about our heritage, um now that we're entering the virtual world so like you know like the metaverse or like using the ai for example uh, not even the metaverse but like in, let's imagine that we are going to use ai into building like physical buildings so in order for it to be like uh, the ai needs to be inspired from somewhere it needs to have its own data set to start building with it if it doesn't have enough information about our heritage it couldn't use our heritage in its in its building, in building anything really, or like in, in its generation of our buildings. So, so if like in the future, if you wanted to build something uh, like a building inspired by the Islamic arts, you just won't be able to do it because it wasn't trained to do it. You have to train the model to do it. And uh, we need to start early on um, in doing so. And uh, I, I thought like this is like a huge fact 
Uh, I think it's being addressed. I'm not sure if it's addressed in the right way, though. Um, or maybe it will take more time. Maybe there it will. I mean, maybe maybe it will exist in some um, some sort, but there will be some kind of advice anyway towards like futurism or like future buildings, because again, that's what everybody's really interested in. You will you will hardly find any designers or architects who are really interested in um, in history, or even if they are interested in history, they are interested in documenting it or learning about it, but not using it into building, um, you know, into like um, as an inspiration to build new things, which is again, um, I think it's really important that we understand our history or our past and like, you know, to try to um, reflect that on our future. So yeah, that's that's kind of one bias. There's a lot of biases, but kind of that's like the main bias that kind of interests me as a as an architect. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So my next question to you, Hassan, is that uh, what is your thoughts? What are your thoughts on the metaverse? And is that a space that you want to explore for your computational designs? Uh, the metaverse and NFTs specifically, if we talk about. Hmm. Yeah. Well. Yeah. I haven't been. I mean, I haven't been personally into the metaverse myself. Um, Again, I, I don't, I kind of don't know like how to think about it in the sense of like how it will become our future in a way. I think there's a lot of debates that's going on like the metaverse and like will it succeed and will it not? But uh, one thing that I'm really interested about like uh, how to see is how to, how I see uh, the designs like in the metaverse, like the architectural designs, which is really kind of, I haven't seen a lot to be honest with you, but anything that I've seen about the metaverse kind of I wasn't really impressed by because I felt like we're trying to replicate real architecture into like virtual worlds, which kind of doesn't make sense because again, like I think like one a great thing about like the technology is is that it allows us to escape reality by all its limitations. So I don't think in the metaverse, I don't think we need to think about the limitations of physics. Or like, you know, we don't need to think about like windows in the sense that or walls or doors in the sense that we think about it like in in like as architects. But uh, I think it's the role of the architects right now to become more artists into developing that. I'm not even sure if architects are the best uh, people to kind of design for the metaverse. You know what I mean? It's 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 probably maybe like uh, a user experience designer will build a better metaverse model because they understand the psychology and they understand how people are um, are using the technology in ways, you know, like a game designer. I don't know, but um, I, I the AI tools right now. I mean, the concepts that we generate using AI tools, they are kind of more suitable for the metaverse than actually the, the real world uh, in so many ways. Uh, so I think that will kind of Maybe I think if the metaverse is something that's like has a quite the future, I think like the uh, the implic like the, um, the the AI will be a great tool to be implemented in that uh, in that domain. Um, as for the NFTs, I I think a lot of people are mainly using now uh, AI tools to generate NFTs. Uh, it's like uh, I mean, NFTs in its sense is kind of great way. I mean, again, I, I don't know how to think about it in such a comprehensive way, but I think it's kind of uh, it's kind of democratizing the art world, right? It's like you don't now yeah. you don't have to become uh, a popular artist to try to sell your work, or uh, you don't have to contact like all these galleries or like you know they kind of cut the metal man's role in a way. They yeah. just like. Yeah, we don't need the middleman anymore to produce art. But again, it made it really hard to get into, right? It's uh, right. I mean, maybe it was much easier to get into if you were back in 2020. But right now, try to sell your own arts as NFTs. It's kind of challenging because there are just so many uh, NFTs out there. Um, and, you know, and also because like I, I don't think like the blockchain concept has kind of settled in into the humanity just yet. I mean, yeah. I, a lot of people are dealing with like cryptocurrency, but again, not enough people to turn that uh, idea into like the popular masses anyway. Um, but I think like tools like uh, AI and the technologies like NFTs, 
uh, are actually changing uh, how we think about arts and um, in, in, in so many ways that it creates such an abundance in like the artworks that we have as hu as humans or like that we can see as humans. And uh, it's I think it's a good thing and a bad thing. Um, um, and actually, I don't know, it, it's just it comes when you combine these technologies together, it, it you come to a point where it's so hard to kind of predict what's what's going to happen next. You can only have your own ideas, but uh, it, it's just like changing everything that we know about art and creativity, and we haven't really absorbed that yet. We we can't fathom that, like you know, fast enough. And uh, <clears throat> I think it will be a really interesting period. Uh, the, the the next coming uh, the next coming day the next coming day, years. It's it's going to be very interesting. I think. Um, does that answer the question? Are... Actually, I don't know. It does. That's okay. It does. It does. Yes. Okay. Um, maybe I'll have one more question because um, yeah, sure. uh, we noticed both of us noticed that you have a huge following on Instagram. I, I wasn't really aware of it uh, when I messaged you on LinkedIn and I'm really <laughs> grateful that you replied to my message. And then I realized, oh, this person might be really busy uh, nowadays <laughs> and don't have that much time to reply to my message. But thanks again for, for uh, accepting and doing this with us. Um, and coming back to the Instagram thing, um, do you have any, um, um, like, was it a organic growth? Like, how, how did you manage to get to that point? Like, because yeah. as a society, we are trying to uh, become more present on our campus. It's quite a new society. Huh. Data science one. So we are doing all these things. We are trying to tap into all these powers, like podcasts, research areas. We are trying to do, we are doing courses. So we're trying to do as much as we can, but also we are aware of the fact that if you don't promote them well enough or you if you don't uh, get to enough people, uh, some of therefore might be lost in the way. Yeah, well, that's his request. It's a very interesting question. I actually don't know how I got that many people. <laughs> uh, actually, I, I, or maybe I, I think I think at one point, so I've been I've been doing my own designs for a few years now. Um, last year, I've been trying to kind of promote my own uh, designs. I've been trying to, I was doing furniture designs, um, like I did furniture designs in the past. Last year, I was trying to do like uh, pattern for apparel designs. I was trying to kind of put that into the market. I also made patterns for like gift trappings and whatnot. And uh, all my uh, my attempts to kind of get like uh, something that's going on, like it's really failed, it failed miserably. And um, so yeah, before I I used the uh, before I used my journey, I think I had about five hundred people on my uh, Instagram oh, wow. account. Yeah, that that's like four months ago or like five months ago. And um, actually, they they were mostly my friends. <laughs> I <think laughs> I that. <laughs> yeah, and I remember last year when I was trying to make some posts. I remember like one night I woke up and there and one post of mine like had like 200 likes and I was really psyched that like oh my god how I got like this many like that's crazy and yeah I just and I I wanted to replicate what I was doing but I I failed miserably I couldn't do that anymore but then when I was uh, using the AI I knew that I had I had better chance in employing that to my benefit if I became a little bit more of a content creator. You know, because mm -hmm. that's kind of how you if you want to grow in your social media, you have to become a creator in a way. So there are I think there are some kind of tricks to to it. Again, I'm not sure if my approach, which that actually made me make this um, have this kind of followership on Instagram because it's I can do that on Twitter, for example, or like I'm, I'm not really focused to do that on Twitter. LinkedIn, I have like some followership uh, too. Yeah, so these like are my main two platforms. And uh, so, yeah, you just like need to think it like a content creator. I think I was kind of lucky enough to be one of like uh, very first few people to uh, use AI and in architecture in a way. I was really working so I was working like 24 seven all the time using my phone. Yeah, I, I remember at one point, I think I stopped taking my car to go to other places and I used Uber, so I just can't continue working on my phone. It's oh, wow. yeah, I, yeah, I, I, yeah, I was leaving like two or three hours a day 
and uh, because I also work uh, like I also work as computation designer and this is like a very stressful and a very uh, very time consuming job uh, so I had to make up like with the time uh, so yeah I worked like like told like 24 7 I was uh, at one point I was posting about three times on Instagram uh, every day um, and yeah, I think at one point, uh, I actually, I think when I first started posting, I noticed that my follow, my follow, like my followers are kind of, my followers numbers are decreasing. And this was kind of really surprising in the beginning, like why they are decreasing, I'm doing everything right. So like, yeah, you need to learn like what kind of hashtags that's kind of work uh, with, with your work, you know, like kind of learn uh, where to put your work into. Like, for example, if you're building something that's like related to architecture, you just don't post it into like an artistic platform, for example, unless it has some artistic value to it. Mm -hmm. And uh, yet yeah, the growth was kind of really organic. I didn't do any promotions uh, at all. Um, I, 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 at one point, I think I was starting to contact uh, online platforms to pop, to get my work published. For example, like my, I I first contacted Design Boom for one of my first designs, uh, and uh, after that, it just like it picked up from there. Like a lot of that, my work got like more attention. So actually, after that, like magazines actually was trying to contact me to publish my work. I wrote a lot of articles about it. Um, that's kind of helped too with the growth of my followership. I think because again, like becoming like I'm I'm using this tool for exploration, right? And mm -hmm. uh, this kind of had it. It's not only visual, but also there's a, like a theoretical part in it. Like you know, you I I kind of use Instagram as a way to document my findings in a way. You know, I'm not a researcher, but this is like a very visual research. So mm -hmm. I was always trying to like explore the tool and then open the platform like on Instagram uh to see like to 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 tell people how i think about the tool and i think that was really interesting it got me in a, in contact with a lot of like interesting people a lot of like similar minds like people are also exploring these tools but they're they're in own in their own ways and uh yeah i think like yeah i think i had like this time of like spark where i was gaining about 10 thousand followers every week which oh, was wow. like yeah, one day I gained like over 3000 followers. It was it was nuts. Like, uh, yeah, I was looking at my wife and I was just like, what what the hell is happening? It's, <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think at that point I was really in, I was really focused into trying to uh, explore the tool, but also trying to open uh, opportunities for myself to continue that exploration. And that will only come through exposure. And uh, but again, I saying after saying that i think a lot of like people who are using ai have got some kind of boost in their followership or, like number of followers or like in their reach mm -hmm. because again there's a lot of uh interest in that topic yeah. at, la at least like maybe like maybe now it's kind of decreasing so right now my my growth is not like it's not as as, as it was like uh one month or two months back and that's fine um, but I think at one point there's there was some kind of boost for anybody who's using the AI tools. So maybe one theory of it is that you know like the um, uh, Instagram uh, the Instagram algorithm is run by AI basically, right? So maybe it's oh, yeah. like one AI that's helping another AI. Like <laughs> maybe yeah, maybe it's like that's their way to kind of conquer the human world. That's how <laughs> they control this. So. so they are making like they they are increasing the reach of these tools again. Um, um, I don't know, but yeah, I mean, yeah. if you want, if you want some tips, you need to really think a little bit like a digital creator if you want to get like, you know, uh, exposure, I guess. Yeah, no, that's valuable. Uh, everything was valuable what we discussed today, because um, even though uh, some of the skills are not uh, and some of the things that you've, you've we've discussed are not directly linked to uh, data science and uh, People that are doing math, stats, econ, or uh, what uh, what not that our uh, our followers and audience are studying, but um, a lot of the skills are transferable, and a lot of the thinking it helps uh, you grow, and um, especially I think what I personally take out of this discussion is to be consistent and pursue what you and uh, 
explore what you like and what you what you want to achieve because uh, without constant effort i don't think you can reach uh, anything so as students uh, we are always burdened by coursework and other stuff but i think we still need to, we need we still need to allocate time for what we actually desire and what we actually want to do so thanks for the inspiration on, on that part so i hope i hope everybody will take at least one lesson there are plenty from these discussions yeah. Yeah. yeah thank you for having me it was yeah it was a fun conversation i had fun i think just adding to what alexandra said i think a lot of our students were really excited when we told them that we're hosting you for our podcast episode okay. and uh, i think it's a wonderful episode where we've seen creativity mixed with philosophy and then technology so it yeah. was absolutely lovely having you and you know thank you so much for bearing with us and being so generous with your time so thank you so much no thank you for having me i was really having fun and uh, yeah it's uh, it was great <laughs>